Welcome. Um, again, my great pleasure to introduce our fantastic speaker today, uh, Professor Paul Fountas from the University of Leiden, where he directs the Centre for Science and Technology Studies. And prior to that, he had a spell at the um, um, Academy of um, Science in the Netherlands uh, for quite some time. Uh, Professor um, Bauter's work in science and metrics, I think, is quite well known um, in, the, in the UK and internationally. Um, he um, most recently has also been involved in um, the EPI uh, review of metrics, <laughs> a number of other um, uh, projects that involve um, stakeholders in um, England and in the UK. Um, but he also authored the um, a Leiden Manifesto yes. for um, um, metrics, for the use of metrics, which was published in Nature, if I'm, if, if yes. I'm not wrong, and has um, produced a little bit of a storm on, um, in the Twitter sphere, um, I'm very pleased to say. Um, it's a principled approach of how we might think about using metrics in relation to academic practice. Um, very, very welcome, you are, and we look forward to your talk. Okay. Well, thank you very much for the kind invitation to... Uh, talk with you and exchange ideas. Uh, thanks for coming. I know it's extremely busy <laughs> in, uh, in Oxford at the moment, so I'm very grateful that you could find some time uh, for this relatively uh, complex topic. Uh, what I would like to do is, uh, I'm, I'm not going to deal in detail with things like the research excellence framework, because I think I don't know enough about the precise ways it works to, uh, to talk to you about it, you know more about it than I do. Uh, what I would like to do is um, indicate a kind of theoretical background from which we at the Center for Science and Technology Studies at Leiden are looking at evaluation processes in science. It will be a critical approach, uh, although at the Center we are um, using indicators, we are also quite critical about the effects it has and also potential unwanted or perverse effects. Um, I will try to uh, discuss with you possible theoretical frameworks that may be useful to understand the interaction between evaluation processes and processes of knowledge creation. And then I'll quickly go through some of the issues around uh, how the role of citations. Uh, I thought that as a scientometrician I couldn't evade that, but also because it struck me during the various meetings that I had as member of the steering group of the, uh, on, on the role of metrics in the next research excellence framework at Hefke that in the UK there is quite a lot of attention on citations um, and there are all sorts of expectations what they might measure um, so I thought it might still be useful to discuss that and then I would like to end with a couple of slides about the notion of quality this is a bit speculative but um, I didn't know that Ralph would be here, otherwise I would have <laughs> maybe made, made them even bigger. But <laughs> we have a, a very interesting, uh, many, for many years, interesting exchange notions of quality. I've also learned a lot at, you know, at my stay at the Oxford Internet Institute a couple of years ago here, so I to pay back a bit with, in, uh, give back, you know, not pay back in the negative sense, but <laughs> give back. Uh, some ideas about quality, how we might think about it. Hi, coming. I just started, so you didn't miss anything yet. Okay, that's good. Uh, okay, let's see about it. Yeah. Uh, 2013, cover of The Economist, How Science Goes Wrong. Uh, it was one of the first times, I think, that a general journal was pointing to fundamental problems in the way science operates as an institution and as an intellectual um, yeah, adventure, endeavor, enterprise. And this was basically the claim um, in that article. It was uh, pretty well researched, of course a journalist uh, approach to research, but pretty thorough. Um, focusing on laboratory science, claiming that scientists had too much trust in each other, 
were not critical enough with respect to the quality of the data, uh, and they were also claiming uh, that uh, venture capitalists had, had to, as a rule of thumb, that you couldn't trust half of the scientific publication, so less than half would be something to put your money in. Um, now, you could say this is just, um, uh, well, a pretty provocative weekly, and maybe they exaggerate a bit, which they tend to do now and then. But this was not the only site. There is a movement in the Netherlands called Science in Transition, which relates to, um, to comparable problems. Uh, it's led by a number of people in the biomedical sciences, among them the dean of one of the biggest university medical centers in the Netherlands, at Utrecht University. But they team together with historians of science and with uh, social scientists, claiming that science is a slightly different approach from the economist, but pointing to a, a problem in trust as well, claiming that science has become too much focused on itself, and that one of the main problems is that in evaluation of research, uh, publishing in international English language peer-reviewed journals has become the main goal, and the best way to develop your career is to, to make sure that those articles keep growing, that your Hirsch index is one of the bibliometric indicators, and your journal impact factor, the, 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 fact, the impact factor of the journals you publish in, should be high enough. If that's the case, then your career can grow. Whereas, if you focus on risky research that may solve main problems in healthcare or in diseases or in society at large, you run the risk of not having a career at all. So here the Science and Transition movement is focusing on the societal interaction, the societal use of research and claiming that science has become too, too isolated in a sense, too much autistic in a sense, as an institution. Another sound, a bit different again, but pointing to comparable um, uh, problems, Nobel Prize winners in science, in the journal science, claiming that there is a main a serious problem with U.S. biomedical research. They're a bit focusing on the U.S., but the problems they mention are clearly international of nature. Um, and these are their points. There is an imbalance between the funding available and that's needed to keep, uh, keep research uh, yeah, keep growing. Um, the, there is a problem in career structure. We are producing more scientists, PhD degrees, than can be absorbed in the scientific system. Uh, there is a hyper-competition, so what they call hyper-competitions are kind of overdriven and over, over, overheated competition for resources. And according to these people, and they are uh, pretty uh, well, prestigious and experienced researchers, they have a very good overview of the biomedical field. They think that this decreases risk taking and original thinking among researchers. Um, different from science and transition, they claim that translational research is overvalued rather than undervalued. So it's an interesting conflict of uh, perspective. Um, and um, but they do agree with the science in transition movement that there is too much focus on high impact journals. That this is you know too, and it's partly you know then it's partly about the journal in which this was published by the science in nature. Um, and um, they also think that the quality of evaluation has declined. Um, so this is one kind of. Um, trend, and I could have uh, mentioned more articles. So there are not, there's a series of constant you know, worry and anxiety. There is something wrong, but it's not so clear what exactly is wrong, and the, the solutions proposed are often slightly different or simply conflicting. At the same time, at Center in Leiden, we experience another 
trend, which, uh, which is basically uh, the result, I think, of the fact that research leaders, leaders of institute and leaders of research groups, have, have been forced to become, to think more strategically. So these are the questions that, that are often posed to us. This is the reason why people ask us to do uh, analysis and evaluation reporting and produce indicator reports. Um, so how could we, you know, monitor what we are doing? How can we profile ourselves? How can we become more competitive, more attractive in the competition? Um, but also things like what is actually our area of expertise? And this points to another problem that especially if researchers are working at the intersection between different fields, because of the size of the literature and the exploding magnitude of the operation, it's becoming increasingly difficult to, to have an overview. It's not sufficient anymore to read your literature. And also the role of reviews, for example, is, is clearly uh, being undermined partly. So the traditional literature review is almost impossible to produce. Um, so this means that there, that there is a demand for new ways of trying to understand where you are in this complex network of research and also how, how, how the interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity of research is developing. Um, the result of this is that, and this is a conflict with the earlier worry and, and debate that I mentioned, that research leaders have the feeling that they don't need less indicators and less information, they need more information more strategic intelligence in order to be able to, to lead their group and to, to make sure that the research they're doing is still societally and scientifically relevant and, and, and addresses the issues that are indeed important. Um, so what we, what we experience in Leiden is an increasing demand for information about research. Now this is interesting because it conflicts with the debate that I mentioned earlier, which tends to have the conclusion that we should get rid of all this indicator stuff, meta information, because it's, 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 it's misleading, it's perverse, it's undermining the intellectual honesty or integrity. So this is, uh, and it's both happening at the same time, and what we perceive is that it often is voiced by the same people in different contexts. So it seems that a number of our, uh, yeah, that, that we are in some kind of split personality situation. And that's what I want to talk about a bit. Um, so what we see is an increasing demand for all sorts of reasons that I try to make clear on this slide. Um, but there is also an increased supply of data about research. Web-based research, uh, Rolf and the OII know a lot about that. Uh, we have data producing machines and sensors, so you see a deluge of data um, in a number of fields, not only anymore in astronomy, also in some parts of the humanities, in the social sciences, the need to, to, to make paradigm shifts, to create new models of what it is to do research. E-research uh, is an important issue here. Knowledge Machines, a new book by Eric and Ralph that is very interesting. Um, and we also see an increased scale of collaboration um, at, the, at, the, at the level, international teams, also in fields that traditionally were more focused perhaps on their own nationality or on local issues. And uh, the, well, we have of course the large scale databases of publications, data and applications. So anyway, this, so what, what, uh, if you only look at this slide, the, the solution is simple. We have an increasing demand and an increasing supply, so just mix them and the, the problem is solved. Um, okay, I think that um, we are in a situation that both this demand for more information about research and information about information basically, and the worry and the anxiety are, are pointing to important trends. They're both true in a sense. They're both pointing to important problems. And I think it relates to four underlying problems that need to be tackled. And I do agree with the people that 
tend to think that there are fundamental problems in the way science and scientific research, including the social sciences and humanities, so I take a broad perspective here, the, the continental European view, Wissenschaft, um, that, that there, is a fun, there are a number of fundamental problems, but they are not, they are partly the result of the success of scientific research, the power of systematic scientific research to generate innovation, both in society and the economy and in science itself, the role of instruments, uh, the role of technology, but also partly a failure of the social structure to adapt, to, uh, to create new, new institutional uh, uh, incentives, uh, to create new spaces for intellectual uh, uh, adventures. And I think there are four main issues, and I would quickly, because I think you can only talk about problems in the evaluation system, which is the main focus of this talk, if we also understand that it's not an isolated problem. It's not the case that oh, if only we did the research excellence framework a bit better, that the problems would be solved. Uh, they are connected with each other, and only if we try to capture that intersection between those four problems can we think about more fundamental solutions. First problem is that um, there is in general a lack between the level of funding in general for science and the fact that the system is built on permanent growth of funding. So the whole structure is actually aimed or, or based on the assumption that it will be possible to keep growing and that's clearly not the case. Second, uh, there is an increasing problem with the dominant model of project-based funding and the need increasingly for infrastructures that are maintained and funded on a much larger, longer time scale and also with much more support staff and uh, more hybrid uh, positions where people need to be funded in a more, on a more permanent basis rather than the temporary basis of funding. Um, um, and there is um, uh, clearly a problem in funding system, but this depends a bit, uh, varies by country, where you have uh, competition for several resources for funding, so uh, uh, company funding, uh, cultural heritage uh, funding, um, and uh, the traditional streams of uh, research councils, <laughs> basic funding based on teaching. Um, and uh, this has partly, but this very strongly by country, is partly to do with the models by which universities allocate internally the, the funding for both research and teaching. And, and this is, uh, is a quite complicated matter and there are many perverse effects happening at different levels. Uh, so for example in the Netherlands we have a bonus if you have a PhD student that successfully completes. PhD degree, but then what happens with that bonus is actually quite interesting to see and it varies by university. So, so these I think are some of the key problems in funding and my apologies, I'll send the, the slide with uh, these points. So. Second is career structure. Uh, this is uh, studied by a number of people in yeah, what you could call the political economy of research and also by a number of career studies people. So, and the general complaint is actually that in general universities are not very good in developing a, a, a possibility for people to have interesting careers in the long term, except for those who are successful in becoming a professor. So it's a kind of one-dimensional way of thinking. Um, PhDs and postdocs are very often increasingly in the larger uh, uh, sciences, I mean the natural sciences, biomedical research, mainly functioning as cheap labor. Um, and there is a interesting dilemma here. It's in the interest of many PIs to maintain this situation because it makes it possible to do a lot of research with a relatively scarce amount of money at the same time it means that most of the PhDs and postdocs don't really have a perspective to, to keep working in science. They, most of them at some point have to leave the system, but they're not trained for that. They're not prepared for that situation. And many people don't have the skills to really become, for example, 
uh, start to work in industry we have uh, quite different skills and also important um, so this is yeah, basically also leading to hyper competition for positions not only for money but also for positions um, and it may also increase a kind of isolation between university and society so where 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 people are, 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 are trained and, and, and educated in this university atmosphere which is a bit of a bubble and they're not enough, you know, don't have enough interactions with all sorts of demands that society at large uh, may have about research. Uh, what we see in a number of situations, not everywhere I think, is a separation between researchers and teachers, so where, where researchers are very happy to get rid of teaching if they have a nice project and then a lowly paid uh, uh, other person has to start to do the teaching and feels not you know powered not empowered to do research so this, this, this is also a problem that's debated quite a lot in a number of universities uh, and this may all point to increasing inequalities in, in the stratification of the workforce at universities um, yeah, there are also complaints about the lack of diversity, so the position of women, it's clear that female professors are far less uh, in, in, in represented than they should be, uh, but there are also trends that this is improving in a number of uh, areas and fields, so there is a bit of a debate about that. Um, in general, it's clear that there is, there are these systemic problems in the structure of careers and we need to, to do something about that, solve that in some sense. Um, then the publication system, it's clear that it has been massive and it keeps growing exponentially. So this is shown in a recent article about a couple of years ago. It keeps growing and this means that it's not possible to read it anymore in a normal sense. And the point here is that the publication system has not only the function of communication, but it also has a function of codification. Um, so it serves three different roles in a sense. It's the basis for three different social processes. And um, because of historical uh, circumstances, um, evaluation in science has become dependent on, mainly on the publications. So, if you would have started from scratch now with the question, how should we evaluate research, maybe you wouldn't choose to base yourself on publications only. You might want to look at the whole variety of scientific research that's, and the work that's needed for that, the variety of skills and talents that's needed, and then systematically uh, uh, ask yourself, okay, how can we measure this? How can we evaluate this in a qualitative way, in a quantitative way? What should be the balance? But because of how history has developed, um, all the evaluation systems have been been piggybacking, piggybacking, no, piggybacking, piggybacking on the publication system, and commercial publishers have been able to capture that in a pretty uh, smart way. Uh, with the result that if you think about it, most researchers are putting an enormous amount of effort, in may, maybe most of their publication effort, in publishing for the smallest audience possible uh, in a language that is um, yeah, optimally incomprehensible to anyone but the field for which, in which they operate. And many, many journal publications are actually a form of data annotation, you could claim. So it is important that this is made public. I mean, it's in, in the end um, a fantastic innovation that, uh, so somewhere in the 17th century, that scientific research could make progress by being made public, which is a radical, uh, uh, yeah, a radical revolution in a sense compared to the secret knowledge that was dominant in many knowledge systems before. So in that sense it's very yeah, progressive and opened up uh, 
also uh, the process of innovation in society at large. But at the moment, if you look at how um, scientific communication works, um, it has become, uh, uh, yeah, basically the journal article has, been, uh, has become the model in which everything has to be pushed, and at the same time, it's a form of publication for, for a very diversified and specified set of niches. And you could also argue that this should be po it should be possible with the web and with the internet to organize this in a different way. And this is something that we're also uh, trying to develop in a number of projects at Leiden. Um, and then the evaluation system, which you know is based on this publication system in the form of peer review and in the form of indicators. So both are based on the publication system. And this explains a lot about the problems in the evaluation of science, because in a way it's strange that evaluation is so problematic in scientific research, because researchers are evaluating all the time. So in a way it's the thing that you do most of the day. I mean, if you read a book, if you uh, uh, decide which journal to send a manuscript, um, which kind of knowledge claims you want to, 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 to make, what kind of questions to ask, it's all a form of evaluation. But the problem is that there is a discrepancy between the evaluation criteria and the broader role of science. Um, the increased scale of research has created difficulties and many evaluation methods have not been able to scale up. Um, there is a form of scaling up of peer review, but that often means that peer review transforms in a bureaucratic process where committees are taking decisions and where parts of qualitative judgments are translated into tick boxing lists of relatively formalized criteria. So it's moving in a more formalized of quantitative direction rather than original idea of peer review. Um, increasingly, uh, uh, evaluation mm, yeah, wants to engage with individual researchers and many quantitative measures are not applicable at the level of the individual researcher. And last but not least, um, it's, it's clearly the case that the development of scientific research creates new forms of communication and new forms of results all the time, but this is not uh, taken up as quickly as it should be in the evaluation system. It's often very, very difficult for people who are producing un, 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 non-traditional formats to be recognized or to be visible in the evaluation system. Okay, um, I'll skip this one. This is an overview of how we tackle this problem in Leiden. So we do this with quantitative means and with the focused research on in five different working groups, focusing on careers, on evaluation practices, on the societal impact of research, on career studies, and specifically also on the social sciences and humanities. Because in the social sciences and humanities, especially in the qualitative, more uh, uh, yeah, explorative fields or hermeneutic fields, you see that these other problems are combined, are being combined in, in new ways <coughs> compared to the natural sciences or the biomedical sciences. Okay. Um, in order to better understand how uh, evaluation can be developed, how, how it can be improved, and how it can couple with, in a productive way, with knowledge creation, we need to understand what evaluation is. And here I think an interesting book has been published by a, a Danish economist, and it deals with these kind of questions. So these are, these are the questions that we would like to know, and a number of colleagues internationally are studying this, and we also in Leiden. Uh, I will come back to the concepts of quality at the end of the talk. Um, but it is important to first of all understand, and I borrow this from Paul Edwards, an interesting historian of science, uh, that knowledge is infrastructure. So, so if you think about why 
is science so successful? It's not because we are now smarter as individuals than people were in the 12th century. It's because a infra, an infrastructure has been developed which can build upon itself, which reflexively operates on itself. And the point is that infrastructures evolve, they are not constructed, they are evolved, so they are unplanned in many ways. You can construct bits of infrastructures, but the whole evolves. Um, very often, at a certain point, they become invisible, they are taken for granted. They are supported by a lot of work that's often made invisible as well, and they embody both technical and social standards. Um, and if we understand this, the question about how evaluation operates also takes a slightly different form. What we see is that partly related to this growth of knowledge as an infrastructure, that evaluation is really spreading and, and keeps spreading. And my, my uh, feeling is, or, or we, we think in Leiden, that it doesn't make much sense to try to stop this because it's intimately connected with the dynamic in this infrastructure. <clears throat> and there are many reasons why uh, parts of that should be evaluated. And evaluation also has a progressive democratic role because it uh, enables uh, society to ask questions to professionalized communities. So it prevents a certain capture of special of parts of fields by special interests. <laughs> And this is quite important, for example, in biomedical research, it's quite important to, to, to have a, a kind of, yeah, to know whether or not a particular field is captured, for example, by the pharmaceutical industry. So you want to have uh, 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 researchers also to play a critical role. And here evaluation can promote this. Um, what we see is at the same time that although evaluation, you could say in a sense, is something that you would like to, to, to develop, to promote, because it can answer important questions about the effectiveness, effectiveness of research and the quality, what we see is that parts of the evaluation process start to live a life of their own. That some of the more formalized processes are taking over, and the less formal, the more informal, intuition-based forms of evaluation lose ground. And this has to do with, um, with the nature of evaluation. And we see this also in the new trends in assessment that we see at Leiden University. So at our center, what we see is that increasingly universities are exploring the use of bibliometric methodologies. <coughs> Libraries are asked to do that. They buy databases that enables it. People do it themselves all the time about themselves. A lot of researchers are actually quite interested in their Hirsch index or in the way they, they see, are visible in Google Scholar. Um, this is also partly called emergence of altmetrics. So this is a hot debate also in, in the UK here, how altmetrics can be used to measure societal impact of research. Um, and um, yeah, the, the strategic problem that I mentioned earlier also uh, leads to the fact that individual researchers already at the stage of PhD students are asking, okay, which journals should I publish in? And what should be my criteria? And very often they look at some kinds of indicators. Now, this, this, these kind of processes have at a more general level been developed um, um, in an argument about the nature of evaluation by Peter Dahler Larsen, an interesting Danish economist who has uh, studied, I think, all his professional life, the process of evaluation. He comes from evaluation studies. And also, partly, this is a field with, with originally with high expectations about what evaluation could do in the sense of good uh, practices. And his the point here is, so evaluation you can't reject you know, as an individual, you can't say I don't want to be evaluated, because if you say this you're immediately suspect of possibly being you know, below the threshold of required uh, quality. And his point is, so the, the, the 
evaluate and he has a, a kind of concrete analysis of what evaluation means but the main point is uh, that evaluation has become a disembedded social practice it has become disconnected from the primary processes that it needs to evaluate and this is actually his main argument in the book um, so this is uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, observations, and this is very recognizable for people who are dealing with research evaluations. So I've been in a situation in one of the social sciences that we were asked to discuss a plan for evaluation of some discipline at the national level in the Netherlands. We, were, we visited the committee. The committee had clearly sent in a request to us to support them. And then on the spot, they got a big disagreement about what actually should be evaluated and in what way. They didn't agree about the goals of the evaluation. And this is a very common process. So it has to do with the fact that um, it's a much messier process than, than you would expect. It's not this rational, uh, 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 well-organized, uh, rationalistic operation. Um, and Dala Larsen um, also asks this question, and this is very valid for research. So how are we so sure that it's so good to evaluate if actually the empirical data and the indicators may not be so very good, or may not fit the operation itself? And interesting is, although we know that in some fields citation analysis doesn't make any sense, at the same time, it's very difficult for the researchers in that field to say we don't want to have any evaluation, then there must be something else. And then they start to look at Google Scholar, for example, where you have lots of data quality problems. <coughs> okay. Um, Dala Larson makes clear that there are three different approaches to evaluation, and I think they are relevant for our discussion. <coughs> The original idea, of course, the dream, the rational organization where you have clear goals and then you can simply measure whether the goals have been reached. A pretty straightforward kind of measurement. This is the way of thinking of many early scientometricians. They were thinking it should be possible to measure science as hard as you can measure nature and this means that you can also simply measure whether a research group is good or not. And if you then average all the indicators in the world, and you measure the specific value of the indicator of that group, and it's four times the world average, then you can say it's Nobel Prize quality. So this kind of rationalistic reasoning. The problem here is, and Peter Dalla Larsen in his book has many examples, that this doesn't work like it, <coughs> like this at all. In practice, it doesn't work like this. So the next way of, think, way of thinking in evaluation studies was the learning organization. So clearly, um, this messy process that I mentioned earlier, where people discover while they're doing evaluation what they're actually evaluating and what the goal should be, clearly it's a learning process. So here, that evaluation becomes a cycle, which is um, uh, reflexive and where you can still have uh, a very good outcome in the form of positive feedback. So you learn while you're doing uh, the evaluation. And in a way, it's a big improvement compared to the model of the rational organization. The only problem is it's a little bit too romantic. Um, it doesn't deal with differences in power. It doesn't deal with cynical instrumental behavior. Uh, it doesn't have, everybody is eager to learn in this kind of model. Well, in practice, um, sometimes people want an evaluation because they want to confirm something that they want to do anyway. So, um, and if the evaluation doesn't confirm the expectation, then simply put in a drawer and never look into it again afterwards. In order to be able to, um, to include power structure and differences in, uh, 
in, in, in hierarchies also in the model, Peter Dallas talks about the institutionalized organization, and here evaluation is a ritual that has to be performed in order for the organization to maintain itself. And it's about legitimacy, and evaluation itself is an instrument in the power struggle, and it's also, uh, uh, it also changes the configuration in which the next evaluation round will take place. So this is a much more, you could say, cynical view of evaluation. He maintains, by the way, that even in this situation, uh, it is still valuable to evaluate in the long run, but you have to be very aware of all the effects of how this is organized. Um, and I think if you look at, um, at evaluation in research, what you often see is a mix of the different models. So this, these are purified models, of course. In practice, what you often see is bits of uh, uh, elements of the, the rational model. Um, a lot of researchers really want to learn from the evaluation and want to know where they are. So that, that clearly is not completely, uh, uh, it's not completely uh, irrelevant anymore. The learning model is still partly true, but it's also an institutionalization in a way that makes it yeah, a kind of ritual that has to be performed. And some people I heard in meetings about the ref had a strong feeling in, in, the, in the last sense, basically. Okay. Uh, in his book, Dala Larson comes with the conclusion that we should speak about evaluation machines. And that, um, that we are living in a society where evaluation machines keep operating all the time, and their main function is not so much to evaluate itself, but to make it possible for everything to be evaluated at any point in time. So this is the main social function they have. Uh, this leads to a number of problems. One of them is the performance paradox. Um, and this is what we indeed see in evaluation, that um, uh, if evaluation is mainly motivated and inspired by a, 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 a longing for, to control, to keep controlling the work of particular groups of our institutions, then it tends to undermine the trust in the professional expertise of that group of people. And it tends to demotivate uh, what, you could say, what you could call self-control, or self-evaluation, or self-improvement. And this is also an interesting problem in research evaluation, and a challenge for evaluation, evaluators who want to maintain uh, a drive in researchers to innovate and to create intellectually new ideas. So there you, you must strike some balance between control and trust. There are clearly risks to, for defensive responses. Um, and the big question is, um, what are the costs of evaluation machines, both directly in terms of money and indirectly in terms of the effects they have. Um, if a lot of people start to spend most of their time on increasing their Hirsch index, maybe they don't spend so much time anymore on the really important research for the long term. So this kind of this kind of problems. And uh, this also has to do with, uh, with potential lock-in fact that you, you get a high quality at a very micro level and, and the, the quality at a higher level of aggregation is lost out of sight. Um, and then there of course is a lot of debate about goal displacement and strategic behavior. It's clear that strategic behavior is inevitable and it's also partly what is um, the intended effect of evaluation machines. It's the idea that evaluation changes the behavior of the people in the system that's being evaluated. The point, of course, is what kind of strategic responses are triggered and are they in line 
with the overall direction that the uh, system uh, wants to go into, or the, the government wants the, 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 the system to go into. Um, we, we talk a lot about perverse effects, uh, but uh, Dala Larson makes an interesting argument that it's often not so clear whether an effect is perverse or not. And he tends to prioritize the term constitutive effects, and I think that it's very valuable. So constitutive effects uh, points to the fact that um, evaluation machines are directly impacting upon the content and the quality of the professional work that's being evaluated. Um, and that's inevitable. That's his claim. We shouldn't try to prevent that. That's no problem in itself. Um, and the perverse effect for one person may be the intended effect of the other. So um, you must have some kind of baseline on which you can say, on the basis of which you can say, this is perverse or this is what we want. So it's a political term, a political choice. Um, so in itself, the effect can be perverse or intended. It depends on uh, the point of view. Um, and so analytically more neutral is the term constitutive effects and they can relate to interpretative frames so what kind of uh, interpretation in a particular line of field uh, of research is, uh, is, is dominant uh, it can uh, affect priorities, research agendas for example and thereby the content of a field um, it's clear that uh, evaluation results have a labeling effect. So within a department, people who are very good in getting grants you know, have a, a kind of positive label. Um, people who, who, who do not get grants and also don't publish a lot will have a different label. And there is, of course, a risk that this may, you know, again, then lead to other effects in terms of the priorities. And an interesting problem is that um, indicators and evaluations tend to spread over time. For example, a Danish bibliometric indicator was used to allocate money over universities. It was not intended to be used within universities. But the departments within a particular university that were very successful in, uh, in, in scoring on the system and thereby helped to get more money allocated to that university wanted to be rewarded for that. So you get a kind of uh, fractal process by which in the end you, you run the risk that individual people are actually uh, 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 yeah, allocated in a sense to get money on the basis of this national indicator that's not intended for that level at all. So this is also an effect that uh, that needs to be taken into account. Yeah, and, and uh, what is true for evaluations in general is also true for indicators that are being used in evaluations. Um, and we actually at the moment don't really know to what extent the evaluations we have put in place have effects on the content of the knowledge. We don't really know whether it is increasing the quality or decreasing some claims about uh, uh, risk uh, avoiding behavior by researchers are, are yeah, based on some examples but they don't seem to be true across the whole area there's still a lot of risk taking that's happening and at the moment we don't yeah we don't have a, a kind of overall firm conclusion it's still a topic of ongoing research. What we do know is that there are important effects on the institutional arrangements that's visible. Uh, for example, uh, in the UK, the hiring of researchers in order to increase uh, the, the chances to get money in the research excellence framework. I mean, this kind of shifting of people, and we also see this in the Netherlands, people moving from one university to the other. Um, but the, the, the question, does quality go up or down? And what is the long-term effect on the 
content of the research agendas that we have is still open, I, I would claim. It's not yet clear what the effects are. Um, we do know that the responses by the scientific community are pretty predictable in many ways. It's clear that uh, everybody is uh, behaving strategically, taking this into account. It's also clear that researchers are fundamentally ambivalent about indicators. They will use them if it's, uh, uh, yeah, it makes sense in a certain discourse or a certain situation. At the same time, they're quite aware of the limitations, and they will also be able to critique the indicators fundamentally, so bibliometricians should not think that scientists are in this sense innocent. Scientists are pretty aware of a lot of stuff that's going on. Uh, and they have a sophisticated understanding very often on the basis of the knowledge in their own field. At the same time, uh, the response is also vary by epistemic style in the field. Quantitative researchers often feel more comfortable with indicators than qualitative researchers. Humanities researchers tend to be more dismissive of evaluations in general than people in the biomedical sciences. It's partly also to do with the different business models that are dominant in the different fields. So we, we, we can't explain everything by self-interest. There are also epistemic values and cognitive values that play a role and norms. Okay. How much time do I, at the moment, still have? Okay. Okay. Then I'll think I'll just show you a few slides, but I will really skip through it. Uh, this is meant to undermine the idea that citations can be straightforwardly used to measure quality. And the whole point is that there are two different questions. One is, uh, why do people cite something? And this is very often a question that's studied quite a lot, and there are very good answers to this. And this is always in order to build a better argument in the article for all sorts of reasons. And the other question is, what can you infer from citation patterns? Is it possible to claim that if a particular article is cited more frequently, that it also by definition has a higher quality. And this is not true. And my point is, and I won't go into detail, that one has to dis distinguish these two questions. How can you use citations in an evaluation way is different, cannot be based on answers to the question, why do people cite? And this has partly to do with the fact that um, citations have become uh, a kind of shadow reality related to the publication cycle. So this is the publication cycle going through different stages of research. And what we have seen since the 60s is that there is a massive uh, uh, kind of shadow structure has developed in terms of citation uh, databases in which you can distinguish these patterns and it has become a different cycle so a different representation of research and it's not straightforwardly related to the primary process of knowledge creation um, this is a quote from Blaise Cronin from 2000 who already predicted that if people would be uh, 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 rewarded uh, by scoring high on indicators, by funding, they would act uh, um, strategically and it would start to operate as symbolic capital. And this is true both for citations and for altmetric. There are many reasons why people who have written a very good piece of work will not be cited so very highly. There are many reasons why somebody who has written a me mediocre article can be cited very highly. So there are many intervening variables. And this is one of the reasons why one cannot equate the number of citations with quality. An important point here is that um, the social system of communication 
and the social system of evaluation are two different social institutions. They operate in a different way. And if you measure citations and you use the number of citation evaluation context, you are basically transplanting acts from the communication system into an evaluation framework. Um, and um, the point is that um, this uh, number of citations has started to live a life of its own because of the evaluation context. And this also tends to undermine or to change the reasons for people to cite articles. So for example, we know in a number of very competitive fields that uh, researchers strategically not cite each other or cite the friends of themselves, but this is um, always um, yeah, in, in, within the domain, very often, of citing articles that are relevant. But the choice is now so big that you can, you can still make strategic choices and still be, as it were, within the space of Mertonian norms of citing relevant work. Um, anyway, I don't have time to, uh, um, to go into too much detail because I really want to show uh, a couple of slides about quality. The point is that um, uh, the, the, the citation structures that have developed on the basis of the publication databases have created um, a reality, a representation of science and a reality of scientific research which is distanced from and uh, a, a kind of distorted refraction of the reality of knowledge creation. And it has an impacting on. So that, that's what I'm trying to argue for, but I should have explained this, um, well, I guess in half an hour. Um, the, and the, the fact is that by building indicators, we are basically extending the scientific social system with new objects that then are taken up by the actors again. So it's symbolic objects, clearly, um, but they are uh, really changing in a fundamental way the, the social fabric of scientific research. Um, yeah, these are the kind of interactions between bibliometric maps of science and uh, uh, primary research knowledge producers or researchers, uh, and this is yeah what we what we see on a daily basis. Um, but here, um, three slides and then I'm done. Um, uh, I think that if we want to develop an approach to talk about quality in an interdisciplinary way. We need to take a radical sociological view, in a sense, and see that it is possible to define quality in different dimensions. So one is the, the, the substantive dimension, and this is what experts usually do. So they know their field, they know, for example, everything about water quality, and they know whether a piece of research about water quality is good or not. So. I know a good researcher if I see her, is one of the arguments. I will recognize a good piece of work. Um, very often this is based on the substantive criteria within that particular field. A different dimension, which can be combined with them, is the formalized. So this is the ref. So we follow procedures. And if we follow those procedures correctly, we, in the end, what will come out is a judgment of quality. Um, this is, uh, you could say, related to the methodological approach in scientific research, but then at the meta level. So the, the method of research itself. The third approach would be to say, which is a radical proposal as well, to take the ethnographic view and say, okay, I call high quality everything that the actors that I'm studying call high quality. Uh, so if uh, a pharmaceutical researcher being paid by a big company is saying this study about food is very, very good, or about medicine, then you know I, I, I take that view and I follow the actor. 
um, it does enable a very interesting perspective how different actors are having a quite different definition of quality and how they interact with each other. Um, a traditional sociological uh, approach would be to say that quality in the end is based on interests or on power configurations and that the dominant parties will be able to define what quality is and uh, the, uh, the parties with less power will be so the, the debate about quality then becomes a struggle for power um, and the last um, uh, is the most vague I think uh, but perhaps the most interesting um, where you take a semiotic point of view so this is Latour and his followers and say okay quality is a process of translation it's not something that does exist in a in, a, in an object way uh, or in a, in a stable way but it transforms all the time um, now my proposal is that um, quality is not an intrinsic property of a piece of work um, but it's a, a, a measure of fit between the work that's being produced and the infrastructure in which it tries to embed itself. And in addition to that, my claim would be that quality doesn't really exist outside of systems that measure the quality. So the measurement or the evaluation of quality is the creation of the very notion of quality. Outside of quality measurement systems, we do have properties that combine and form quality. So, for example, a, a stylistic style in a text does clearly already exist before the text is being evaluated. Uh, a statistical procedure is robust or it's not robust. Uh, so there are many components, but before this can become quality, it has to be defined within a measurement system, within a quality definition system. I'm afraid I'm not, maybe I'm not very clear about this, but I'm still thinking about this. But I think this is actually the notion of quality that we're speaking about if we talk about quality in the research excellence framework, quality of research on the long term. Um, and of course, this is a rather meta approach. It's, it completely abstracts from the substance. And it needs to be filled in with the other approaches. So uh, the uh, other uh, perspectives don't disappear, but they, I think, can be combined in a more interdisciplinary approach of what quality might be. So this would be the alternative dimension, uh, and it's mainly about infrastructure, as you will see. So in this sense, it fits very well with all sorts of new work about how knowledge operates. And it also means that um, Quality can be measured, but only partially. It will never be possible to measure quality in a concrete, comprehensive sense. And also, we shouldn't have the dream that altmetrics will be able to measure quality uh, finally in the, in, the, in the true sense of the word. It will always be partial, and important dimensions of quality will be unmeasurable. But in a way, that's a very old-fashioned notion. So I think it's still true. And with that, I would like to thank you very much. My apologies for the, 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 the missing slide about funding. It took me a bit uh, by surprise, but um, anyway, that's a disadvantage of flying in and flying out again. Uh, I hope I wasn't too boring for you, and I hope the quality notion does make a bit of sense. I'm still thinking about it, and I will follow up on it, but um, anyway, I wanted to share this with you. would very much welcome uh, devastating critical remarks, because that's what I learned from. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.